Welcome to the MSU Deer Labs online seminar series brought to you by Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. My name is Steve Damaris and I'm the Taylor Chair in Applied Big Game Research and Instruction at Mississippi State University. Thank you for joining me. An important driver of foraging behavior is are nutrients available when and where they are needed? This graph shows some of our data we collected in two different regions of Mississippi. In the Delta region, which is the, actually the Mississippi River Alluvial Valley, and it's along the West Mississippi, and it's, it's flooded regularly by the Mississippi River, and it's uh, a very rich soil because it is flooded. It's, it's one of the bottomland, deep, nutrient-rich soils. And then there's the thin lurus, which is more shallow and not nearly as high a quality uh, nutrients are present in the thin lurus. And you can see two different things here, spatial variation. And this is a data from a plant called trumpet creeper. And it shows the percent crude protein of trumpet creeper in the delta and in the lurus. The delta in the dark green and the lurus in the kind of the uh, greenish tan and you can see in the springtime this is the growing tip and leaves of trumpet creeper average 24 percent crude protein in the thin lurse areas that we sampled it was about 16 percent crude protein on average that's eight percent protein less than the same species of plant in the delta now the very growing tip is not necessarily different in quality it's that there's more of the growing tips in the plants that are growing in the better quality soil in the delta so uh, the growing the newest growth is probably the same in both the delta and the thin lurus but the delta is producing more of this new growth and so our sampling collected more of the higher quality parts of the trumpet creeper from the delta. And so that shows you that deer in the delta can get more higher quality forage from the delta than it can from the thin lurs. Now let's also look at important temporal variation or seasonal variation. If you look at over at the summertime, you see two things. One, uh, the most important seasonal change is that both regions show a dramatic drop in crude protein content. The crude protein content of trumpet creeper in the delta is down around 12 in the summertime, and in the thin lurus is down uh, about 8.5% crude protein. Now these numbers are really important because the number 16 is a really important figure. And 16 is what deer biologists say that a deer should have as their average crude protein of their diet. So of all the plants that they eat during a day, some of them could be 20%, some of them could be 12%. And if they were half and half, half of them were 20%, half of them were 12%, they would average 16%. And that's what we consider an optimum diet for white-tailed deer, 16% crude protein. So. We can see in the springtime, Delta region is well above that. And in the thin lurse, it just, trumpet creeper just barely makes, you know, the target for the average diet. So a whitetail could do really well on a diet of trumpet creeper in the springtime, but if it had to eat another forage in equal amounts that was only 12% crude protein, then it's gonna average 14 in its overall diet for the day, and that's going to be below what we want to see in a, in a whitetail in the springtime in particular. But let's look at the uh, summertime values. That 12% in the crude protein for the delta is well below the optimum 16% uh, diet quality, and goodness, that 8.5% in, in the thin lurus is, is further well below the optimum diet quality. So summertime is a can be a really challenging period of the year for white-tailed deer in Mississippi and elsewhere in, in the southeast. So this uh, summertime 
nutritional decline in quality is something we really need to work on as biologists and habitat managers. So they're spatial from one region to another, and those regions differ in their major soil characteristics. And then also the temporal variation is really important. Let's look at another example in case you're not in the Southeast. Let's look at an example from Colorado and Montana. These are five locations and they sampled the NDVI, which is an index of photosynthetic activity. And more green means more photosynthetic activity. More photosynthetic activity means more active growth by plants. So we have the five locations running across the top. These columns are the five locations. And we have three months, April, July, and October. Now let's look within April, we can see this, this property has a lot of green and a little bit of brown that is not having any photosynthetic activity, but there's a lot of green around that brown. This other location has very little green, just a little bit over here. And then here again, not much green uh, over here, not a lot of green, more than the last one, but still not a real lot. Uh, and then over here, just a very little bit of green as well. So these four uh, or five total uh, properties show a, a huge variation in the amount of photosynthetic activity within them. And that is an indicator of uh, spatial variation in plant productivity. Now, if we look at all of them in, in July, we see, well, they're all doing pretty good in July they're all producing a lot of plants. There's a lot of growing plants during July. And then in October, we see it's back to the, to the brown again. Back to the brown is a lot of uh, brown and, and a little bit more green here in this particular property. So I would say this is probably the better habitat, or at least certainly the more plant growth activity taking place at that property across the year. All five properties had good plant growth during July. But that doesn't mean they're good deer habitat. It just means it's producing a lot of plants. Now let's talk about plant secondary compounds. These are chemical compounds that plants produce in the battle against being eaten. Plants try to avoid being eaten by their predators, which deer are actually a predator of plants, if you can think of it that way. So plants have a lot of secondary compounds that are adaptations to try to avoid being eaten. One of these classes of chemical compounds are phenolics. A phenolics are astringent tasting compounds. One of them is tannin in an acorn. And if you've ever tried biting an acorn, it makes you pucker. If you're a wildlife biologist, you have bitten a, an acorn. And if you're a forester, you've probably bitten an acorn. If you're a really avid deer hunter, you've probably bitten into an acorn, uh, the meat of an acorn, just to see what it tastes like. What, what are these deer after? They love these acorns so much. Well, you don't love tannin because it's highly astringent. Now this uh, compound, the phenolic, actually binds the protein. And that's where the anti-herbivory comes in. The plant's producing this uh, tannin so that if an animal eats it, the protein that is in the plant actually will inhibit the digestion of that protein. So the protein is there within say an acorn to help provide the building block for the new plant that is going to grow out of that acorn. So it needs to be there for that, but it doesn't want to be there for the deer that is eating the acorn. So it essentially uh, puts a lock on the protein by binding it with tannins into essentially indigestible macromolecules of cellulose. And so uh, this non-digestible compound uh, is a way that plants keep and herbivores from eating them. Although, as we've seen, we've learned that white-tailed deer have these really big salivary glands, so they, they over 
com they compensate for that uh, tannin in the acorns and they can eat them and, and get forage value from them. These phenolics are the most common plant defense compound. They're present in 79% of perennial woody plants. Eight out of 10 species of woody plants will have tannins within them. This graph shows the concentration of tannin, the reduction in digestible protein. So at the lower left-hand corner here, we have relatively low tannins. And as you increase the amount of tannin, you will end up with an increasing reduction in digestible protein. So if the tannin concentration is, is this value, there's actually a reduction of almost four grams of protein per 100 grams of feed. And that's a significant reduction in the digestibility of uh, protein. So a plant that has a lot of tannin is doing its best job to keep the herbivores from reaping the benefits of eating it.